Hello, Guy Shrink listener. For this episode of the Guy Shrink podcast, there were some technical difficulties with the audio in the first five minutes. We deeply apologize for this inconvenience. We have promptly sent our audio engineer to the gulag for a time. He'll be back for the next episode, ready to serve up high quality audio for your listening pleasure. Thank you very much and enjoy the show. Welcome to Guy Shrink, our bi-weekly podcast where we try to talk about things to keep a guy awake at night, uh, stuff that rolls around in his head, uh, relationships, work, uh, family, uh, whatever might be uh, bothersome. And uh, we have some, had, had some interesting uh, conversations the uh, last several months as we launched off. And today I am really, I'm really excited about today's uh, guest, Dr. Jenny Brown from Sydney, Australia. Or, uh, is it Australia or Australasia? I don't you know. But, uh, <laughs> uh, Australia is the country. Australia, Australasia is kind of region, I think. Okay. <laughs> but, yeah, okay. we're, we're de- from down under. Sydney down, down under. under. Down from under. Cold, uh, wet winter Sydney. Yes, we have to forget that here in wonderful Toledo, Ohio, from where we're broadcasting, it's uh, the middle of, uh, middle of July, and, uh, and it's hot as blazes, and it's... Uh, Kind of cold down there in Sydney. They're yeah. in the middle of winter, yeah. uh, which is kind of interesting. Yes. Well, Dr. Brown, thank you for for being willing to to be with me uh, for a little chat about about your work and about what you think as your family therapist. You've been doing that for quite some time. What keeps the guy awake at night? And so, this what, what are some of the things that you've observed over your uh, career as a therapist that keeps the guy awake at night? And then we could launch off on some of this particular things that make you uh, have a different perspective about all that? Oh, that's such a big question, Bill, particularly from a female. Ask my (laughs) husband, David, what keeps him awake at night. I must say that in our early marriage, he learned to sit on the side of the bed upright and say, Jenny, is there anything you need to say to me? Because once his head hit the pillow, he was out to it. And I would be tossing and turning because he hadn't known what I was upset about. So that was many years ago, 40 plus years ago now. He learned um, to to not go to bed too quickly before he'd figured out whether his wife was going to be tossing and turning. But, you know, over the years... I think while he still will go to sleep very quickly, the things that will stir him at night would be definitely work stress. Um, And if there are problems in the broader family, just men and women aren't that different really when it comes to relationship sensitivities and, and worrying about the people we care about. Relationship sensitivities, uh, I know that you're a, a family systems therapist mm-hmm. and uh, you, you have a particular brand of that called Bowen Family Systems Theory. Could you say a little bit about what that's about, that Bowen Family Systems Theory and, and how, you, uh, how, how do you see that as being a kind of a unique understanding of how human beings function? Well, I came across this theory. I was already a trained family therapist In Australia, I was living in the US with my family, husband and young children at the time. I was doing some post-grad training after my master's and came across this theory. And it just spoke to me, not just as a clinician, but as a human being. The way I try to understand myself and my own family became clear and the theory got under my skin again not just as a therapist but as a person I I was just fascinated by its understanding of humans in relationship and it made so much sense to me and if I was going to put it in a nutshell I would say that unlike other theories it sees that the collection of individuals forms an emotional unit like a single organism. We're all affecting each other. It's not linear cause and effect. It's not one person causes an upset in another. It's not even that the experience of a relationship is transferred into a problem in another relationship, which is also cause and effect thinking. It's we're all in this together We're all proving to be difficult to other people. We're all um, 
a resource to other people. And, and I think that seeing it as a single organism, the, a collection of people in a family, and that can be in our teams at work and other places, is so unique for me. It gets beyond blame. And it certainly helps you see that you can play your part in things going better. And that's very hopeful and good news. Yeah, so I, I can bear, I can have a responsibility to make things better. Um, I, I really like what you're saying about um, the family as an emotional field, an emotional context. Uh, as opposed to a bunch of dysfunctional people that have a problem person in their midst. If we can just fix the problem person, everything will be okay. And that's not what uh, Murray Bowen was talking about, was it? No, not at all. And it's, it's a bit of pill for us to swallow that we're playing our part in this. Um, we're the difficult person for someone else who we have our difficult people and we present as a difficult person for many others. Um, so it's hard to be attracted to a theory with that message, isn't it? But as I said already, Bill, I just think it's so hope producing mm. to see that we can make a difference. We're, we're not reliant on other people having to change for the whole system to begin to progress. So, so here's a psychotherapeutic idea that talks about hope, that can really make hope be a, something that can happen versus uh, how bad things are. And, uh, you know, diagnostically, you're really, you're really uh, in a bad way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, um, my latest project is called the Parent Hope Project. It's post, my postdoctoral passion at the moment, applying family systems theory. And so I'm, I never came across the word hope in Bowen theory, but my research with parents has confirmed for me that there's a certain kind of hope that produces growth which is agency-based hope, growth in the self rather than hope in external experts to fix the problem. And that's a, a really valuable kind of hope mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. comes from, I can make a difference here. Oh, that, that is a great, that's great words to hear because then I don't have to be stuck in this, uh, this idea that it's hopeless, uh, end of the road, dead end or whatever. No, oh, that that's really, and that I have agency to make that happen. I have agency, as opposed to being dependent on other everybody else uh, making it happen. Yes, you, you have written a wonderful, exciting book called "Growing Yourself Up." Growing yourself up, <laughs> that, 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 that's agency right there. Uh, could you say a little bit uh, about uh, how how you began writing that book, and 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 what's been the reception of that book in your professional circles? Well, I it's. Uh, been a long project writing a book. I was stirred to write this book as a clinician because I loved being able to recommend to clients books to read as they got interested in systems ideas. And I had my go-to books, um, but I decided to have a go at writing the book that I wish I had to recommend to clients. So there were books that had great case examples, but were very um, light on theory and understanding the map behind the examples. And then there would be a book that was great on theory, but not many case examples of what it looks like. So I really wanted to bring the two together. And interestingly, I, given this is for, for guys, I also was aware that most of these books tended to have a female bias and I had as many male clients as females in the couple work and men doing this work. So I made a, a real effort in this book to have male and female examples going yeah. right through the lifespan. That certainly is an, was an attraction to me as I read the book. The name of the book is Growing Yourself Up, and I, I, Amazon has it uh, if you need to, or, or uh, you probably have a publishing house that you might recommend as well. Um, but it, it's a fantastic read, and I do recommend uh, this to everybody that's listening. Um, easily to got, get and easy to read, really. It's not a, a technical book, and you'll go, oh, my gosh, I do that all the time. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, and of course, like, as you would know, Bill, I write a lot of myself into the book. It's not like the clients out there who are my case examples. I'm my own case example in in the messiness of life and the lessons I've learned mm -hmm. applying mm -hmm. the ideas of Bowen systems theory mm -hmm. to my particular mm -hmm. relationship challenges. Yeah, and, and we all have that relationship challenges. Uh, uh, my biggest challenge is if they would change, things would be better. And, uh, and, and waiting for everybody else to change, which leads me to that question about, I think that Murray Bowen's greatest contribution was that concept of differentiation of self. And could you say a little bit more about how you understand that and why that is such, number one, a unique idea and why it's so important to be a lifelong project for us guys? Mm -hmm. Well, it isn't an easy concept to grasp. Um, I really, my book is about differentiation of self, but I use the word growing self. And my subtitle is how to bring your best to all your relationships. And that's really important to differentiation of self. It is not growing self for the sake of self fulfillment, self-entitlement, not even self-esteem, even though that can be a byproduct of growing differentiation. This is about being a self in our relationships, never separating the two. So to be differentiated is to know self, be aware of self, being able to make thoughtful choices on behalf of self in a way that allows others to learn to do the same back with us, but it's not doing the work for them. It's being more of a self, a clearer self that creates a, a less intense environment because people are less fused and clumped together when one person starts working on their mm -hmm. self in relationship. Mm -hmm. but, but, standing up for yourself without making a big deal about it and knowing that I can be in relationship with everybody else on a one-to-one -one basis, regardless of what other people might think about it. I, I, I can have a healthy That's relationship. That's one of with the challenges. People. Yeah. It's, it's learning to stick with the uncomfortable and not get diverted into being distracted by what's going on for the other, but turning the attention back to who am I in this? Who do I want to be in this? How do I want to represent myself clearly in this situation and make space for the other person to do the same? And That's, remembering yeah. that we're all, it's always reciprocal, back and forth in relationships. And it's messy, this process of working on differentiation. It's not, a, a you know, 10 techniques that will grow you up in the next month. It, it's a lifelong effort, but in I like my that. experience, it's worth it. I, I like that. It's not 10, 10 easy things to do and it'll all work out. You can do it in six weeks or, or whatever, because things change. Shame in about that. Context. Yeah, right, right. Sorry, I'm not going to sell that book this week. Uh, yeah. <laughs> five easy ways to get, get what you want kind of thing. Um, uh, it's, it's about not allowing somebody's emotions to control mine. Um, recognizing that I have emotions, uh, but I don't have to necessarily let them control me, my own emotions as well as the emotions of others, and standing up for myself. This is exactly difficult, and my experience is people don't cheer you on when you do that. They're, they're really kind of, hey, why can't you go back in your cage and be like you're supposed to be? Yeah, yeah, and Bill, I just want to pick up on the standing up for yourself. Mm -hmm. If someone has been an underfunctioner, passively dependent on others, they may need to practice having a voice that could be taking a stand. But if you've been, and this would be me, more of an overfunctioner who can take up too much space in relationships, I need to learn not to always take a stand, to keep my mouth shut, make room for others, be curious and interested in them. So it's not one size fits all in right. working on self in relationship. Being curious about another person's emotional world and thought world uh, is really an important piece. You, you talked about guiding principles, that concept of guiding principles. I, we're talking about that right now, differentiation of self and the, and the things that go into that are guiding principles. What, what's so important, do you think, about the notion of guiding principles? 
Yeah, guiding principles, it, it can become a, a jargon all of its own, can't it? Like, what are guiding principles? Are they values and beliefs? Well, no, there's something different, but values and beliefs that we develop help us clarify our guiding principles. I did write a list of my relationship guiding principles in the appendix of my book, um, even though I think it's important for people to come up with their own, I have found it helpful to hear others' application of their guiding principles. And I know that's borrowing self from others. And then it's, well, how do I action that and find out if that's my guiding principle? So I see the most useful guiding principles are kind of relationship roadmaps, um, if I don't have them, for example, one of my guiding principles is I will not give advice until I have heard the best advice the other is giving themselves. I need that guiding principle as one who was primed as an over-functioner and over-caretaker in my family of origin. So I've got a whole list of those and I try to hold on to them, be aware of them, mm -hmm. pilot them, action them, and see the difference they make. If we don't have those relationship guiding principles, we're just going to be buffeted by whatever the emotional challenges of the day. And we can just get overwhelmed and lose ourselves in that. Relationships, reactivity can blindside us without that map of whatever comes at me, what are my principles for how I want to manage myself as maturely as I can in my marriage, with my adult children, in my now, in my grandparenting, in not mm -hmm. diving in and taking over the role my children have as the primary carers for my grandchildren. I, I don't want to skip my relationship with them. And the list goes on. Lots of key principles. And one thing I am very clear about, principles are different to techniques. Relationship techniques are everywhere out there. And some mm -hmm. of them can be helpful to try, mm -hmm. but they're not principles. Techniques are things we do for a particular situation that may not translate to another very well. And they won't serve us well as a technique mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In, in all situations. Yes, I, one of those techniques that's out there is get rid of toxic people in your life. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, well, yeah. I'd be interested so, in the techniques for how they're doing that. But just yeah. don't, just cut them out. Don't talk to them. Uh, yeah. Kick them kick them out of the club. Whatever uh, you know, hold a grudge. Whatever whatever it is, and then of course it gives you the ability to diagnose somebody as as toxic. And already we're in we're in deep waters. Uh, I, I think you know. I, I too they're was primed. aiming for quick fixes. Aren't yes, they? yes, it's a quick fix. Techniques are quick fixes. Uh, can't d deal with the discomfort that of the situation. That's there. I, I too, like you, Virginia, we're, we're primed to be, uh, your life would be better if I ran it, uh, kind of a, 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 a approach kind of yeah. thing. But what one of the things that I try to do then is to say to someone, so what have you done to solve this problem before you came to me? And to hear what they might, I, I love that thing about what, what's the best advice you can give yourself before I chime in is r really, really good. Yeah. It's not that I ask it that way as a technique, but I hold it in mind as a guide for myself. Have I asked enough questions about how they're dealing with the situation, how they're thinking about it, mm -hmm. what they've tried, what they've learned from that? Not as a therapist in my relationships, just as a, a journey through life with people. Well, and speaking of I journeys. should be doing the same yeah. with them. Yeah, uh, speak, speaking of journeys, you do you do a great job talking about the first half of life and the second half of life and the challenges thereof. And so, in the first half of life, you talked about things about um, uh, you know, being single, leaving home, being single, um, st starting out, uh, getting married, perhaps starting your own family. So, what what are some ways that, that you see Bowen theory? I'll just say that Bowen theory as ways to manage the quicksands that all of these wonderful these wonderful times in our lives present to us. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, they they are um, wonderful opportunities. Each change in the life cycle should be uncomfortable. If it's too comfortable, then we're we're not growing. We're we're filling our gaps with external detours and disguises to keep us comfortable. So I would say at at the those early stages of the adult life cycle, the leaving home, um, one of the common traps is distance, mm -hmm. running away or cutting off. You already mentioned that today. Um, men and women are both are primed for using distance, but uh, my sense is that men um, major in distance in a particularly unique way when things are uncomfortable in relationships and are very quick to allow the females in their life to do the relationship work for them. Hence, of course, the females are part of that problem. That's not caused by distancing men. It's just a, a pattern that goes round and round emotionally. But I think it's just really important to appreciate that at any stage of life that there will be an opportunity for learning about self because our old comforts have been taken away in, in some sense and to not use distance. That would be the key thing and the case examples in the book talk mm -hmm. about. Mm -hmm. I, I think in one of the early chapters, I use the example of a person, a man I call Greg, who had a commitment phobia, a real challenge mm -hmm. to settle down into a, a committed relationship. Um, and a long-suffering woman of eight years courtship, <laughs> thinking, what's going on here? And he had the idea that um, some a counsellor had told him that he had an at attachment trauma when his mother left him with an aunt for two months and he was kind of building his script on I've had this rejection in my life and that's why I'm so cautious of being rejected and as we just looked at the facts and the details of his growing up there was so much more to it than this two-month interlude when his mother had depression. And mostly it was how much intensity he'd been part of in his relationship with his mom and his dad in the outside of that triangle. So it wasn't rupture that was the problem. It was intensity. And he just had to start learning yes. how to yes. be in relationship without needing intensity, which then required him cutting off to reduce the intensity. So, so much of life is learning to live in relationship without this pendulum of yes. Yes. fusion and too much togetherness and neediness and then getting overwhelmed and suffocated and running away and this back yeah. and forth. Yes. Yes, two, uh, uh, two thoughts of that. As, as I read that, I, I, I thought, oh, yeah, I, I, I get this. Two, two ways. Uh, diagnosis is an impediment to insight. Uh, Kathleen Cawley uh, said that one time to me. Uh, and, and there you have Greg had an, an, an impediment to insight because he was diagnosed with that certain kind of uh, attachment disorder, and he stayed stuck there and couldn't see have insight into anything else. And the other, other piece is that the Gottman Institute and they're working with couples. That's the other side of my practice is with couples. Talks about the, the number one, the number one uh, management scheme that guys use in in conflict is stonewalling, which which is which is distancing. You know. Yeah. <laughs> distancing. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, yeah. And Bowen similarly, well, well before Gottman, noticed three f forms of reactivity the attack, defend, or withdraw. And we can all get into all three of them in different <laughs> contexts. Yeah, one of the things I really appreciate about the insights of Bowen theory is that it's just, this is just how human beings work. It's, it's not, we're not talking about pathology here. We're just talking about this is the way you, we work. If we're aware of the way we work, we can change the way we work. Yeah, isn't that great? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, the, the the book is your book is just loaded with wonderful wonderful insight, Jenny. And and as you were talking a minute ago, I was thinking about the two of the things where we find ourselves 
many of us, in marriage and in parenting. And both of those are highly volatile emotionally. And we, we don't, most of the problems that happen in both of those things come from our problem-solving techniques. And, and so could you say a, a little bit about how, uh, about Bowen's insights into marriage and parenting, and, and particularly about parenting, about how parents, if they ma- manage their own emotions towards their kids, their kids might have a better chance of making it. <laughs> oh, they're big questions, Bill. Uh, I think um, it is good to start with marriage and think about the patterns for dealing with in our insecurities in marriage and then how they can flow over into children becoming part of a triangle in our marriages mm. or in our ruptured marriages they're still part of a triangle after divorce but um, the examples that I use in the book on marriage are three different case examples and they illustrate the three maturity detours in a marriage the first is conflict and distance the second is the one up one down or over and under functioning and the third is detouring to a child and how easily a child can fill the breach of a marriage. Bowen theory makes clear that all of these patterns are adaptations. They help people manage, they reduce the experience of stress and anxiety. So it can be, that's why people get very confused about all the talk about anxiety, because we use these mechanisms to reduce our experience of insecurity and stress. It's why we keep doing them. Um, But it's useful to be aware of those three patterns or four patterns, if you call distance a pattern on its own, which it can be without overt conflict. And so the challenges in both marriage and in parenting is to make a project out of ourself, not the other. That was a key (laughs) quote of Bowen in his original research in the 1950s which has been quite inspiring to me and what I'm developing for helping parents and the manual that I've created using Bowen theory to help parents go through a project of themselves and, and redirecting the energy from worrying about their child or trying to change their child or being reactive to the other parenting partner. So this idea, Bowen said that when he saw a parent start to make a project out of themselves rather than fixing their symptomatic young person, that was a turning point in the whole practice of family psychotherapy. And, And I believe that to be the case. That's the turning point for a parent or any of us in any relationship to begin to get interested in what's going on for me. How am I part of this cycle that is getting us nowhere, that my child seems to be doing worse, becoming more reactive, more irresponsible, more dependent? How can I unpack how I'm part of an emotional process, which behavioral interactions give us a clue to the emotional process. Mm -hmm. So I'm, Mm -hmm. that's what I'm doing now in this parenting work is just helping parents track and describe the facts of the back and forth in their relationship. And then we step back and, and apply some principles to the interaction and think about what's, what's the effect of the way I'm responding in the cycle over and over again, what's helpful, what's not helpful. So I I hope that gives a bit of a flavor to your question. I'm I'm excited to hear more about the the Family Hope Project, Jenny. This is really exciting stuff that you're working on um, uh, because everybody I know that's a parent, parenting is befuddling and highly anxious now for, for sure. And it could, so say I, my wife and I call and say we have a troubled kid and we want to come in for a consultation. What, what, what could we expect if we, if we came to your office? What would happen? Well, um, I would be doing what I would do in any of my clinical sessions over the years. I'd be wanting to be curious about what was currently going on 
and start to draw a family diagram who's in the picture and start to draw a timeline so that I'm set laying the groundwork for being a researcher with people. Bowen described the therapy approach as joint research. And that's what I'm wanting to do with parents or with anyone that I'm working with. But at the moment, I'm really focusing in on my work with parents and doing research with all of the parents I work with so I can learn from them about the particular nuances of their efforts to make a project out of themselves and not their child. So after just laying out what's happening in the system, then we move into a structured approach. I have a manual for parents now. Mm. And um, I sometimes wonder if Dr. Bowen would turn in his, his grave hearing that I've created a manual based on his theory. Um, who knows? Um, but I'm doing my best to, I just see the insights of the theory are so useful for people and I'm doing my best to get those ideas out there to more and more people and train professionals to utilize this approach and give them an introduction to Bowen theory through using a manualized program with sure. parents. Sure. And so I could go on all day, Bill, which I mustn't in a short podcast, <laughs> but, but every session, the parents learn to, that we're going to describe an interaction together of a okay. challenge they're having with their child. Okay. And then we're going to step back and learn from it. It's teaching parents to be observers of themselves and, um, I, I, I see that it's an uncomfortable journey for many parents. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Some parents feel great relief. Mm -hmm. at, mm -hmm. You mean I don't have to find a way to fix my child? That's a great relief. Other parents say when they see I'll what, put on a whiteboard the cycle they've described and they will say, oh, gosh, I feel so ashamed and, of course, the helpful tr this trigger in me wants to reassure them and help them feel better about themselves. And I'm cautious not to jump in and do that, to acknowledge that it's confronting. And I found working on myself in my life confronting and humbling. And I know that growth comes out of that discomfort. So I'm not rushing in to try and smooth over the discomfort, but I normalize it that it, it is a tough journey. It takes some courage to look at self and, and start to reconsider the ways we're operating in our relationships. Jenny, this is the most refreshing thing I've heard on parenting, what you're, just, what you're doing right now. Refreshing and, and uh, uh, just breaking some uh, massive new ground uh, because every parenting thing is full of, full of anxiety uh, and, 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 and so, and so I'm a parent who's anxious about my, myself and I'm anxious about my parenting. And then my kid makes me anxious. And if I could get my kid to stop being anxious, I'll feel better. Uh, and, and that's how parenting really kind of is. And as opposed to just paying attention to the emotional life of my kid, uh, Daniel Siegel just said, that's one of the things that Daniel Siegel says, parents just pay attention to the emotional life of your kid. And that's the best thing you can do. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there, there's a lot of research that affirms that children's symptoms, particularly anxiety, and I think other symptoms and diagnostic categories spin out from anxiety, are um, impacted, not caused by it, but impacted by overprotection or overcontrol. I think that's been clear for a couple of decades now. And there are so many versions of that with different parents that it's not all the classic helicopter parenting. I think that society is feeding this intensity of overprotective, anxious parenting. It's very confusing for parents at the moment. I've got a lot of empathy for the journey of parents trying to figure out how they can be their best resource for their children. Mm. So, yeah, I'm mm -hmm. committed to... Um, helping parents to get out of the intensity. And I don't think there are too many approaches that you can't just tell a parent to stop being intense. 
Uh, it's a technique. They have to mm -hmm. find some inner principles for redirecting the way they manage self. And I think Bowen theory has some unique ways of yes. helping parents yes. make yes. that adjustment, yes. make an emotional yes. adjustment. Yes. Are, are you doing some of this teaching that you're talking about right now? Are you doing that available like uh, online so people in America, United I States? Am, could, I could, am. I am. I will send you the link. Oh. Please do. Yeah. Oh, please do. Oh, yeah. this is wonderful, Jenny. You, you made you, your book is just absolutely marvelous on so many levels. But there's a really unique twist you make uh, uh, when when you start talking about um, being. You didn't use the phrase "world citizen," but in all of our relationships, and we're we're citizens of the world. And and Bowen Bowen theory's got some things to say about how to be a citizen. He didn't use those words, but the societal regression, that was one of his phrases, uh, that, that anxiety is a societal thing, and, and society's telling parents that you're incompetent or whatever. That's a piece of what's going on. What do you think, in your observation you know, from Australia and seeing the rest of the world from your Australian eyes, what, what do you see maybe as like three, three world dilemmas that are facing people no matter where they live in the globe? What might they be? Oh, it's, I mean, I just take a big sigh when I think about the current state of the world and, and from Australia, wherever, whatever vantage point, there are some really big challenges facing our planet. We all know what they are. Climate change, the threat of a catastrophic war spreading, um, the gap between the rich and poor is growing and the problems of famine and hunger and poverty increasing. I mean, that's pretty depressing, isn't it? Um, we're, we're seeing that from all angles. And, of course, they are symptoms. So the challenges are not quick fixes for the symptoms. The challenges are relational, um, how people can become more principled rather than reactive, how we can be curious about people we disagree with because polarizing is rife. Um, it's in our country. It looks particularly intense as I look from Australia at the U.S. at the moment, and I wonder the U.S. is uh, no longer going to be a major world power in the future. So there's a loss of status for a country. Mm -hmm. Australia's always been small in status, although we think we're more important than we are. Um, so how to answer that question, Bill, is a challenge. And the way I think about it is our opinions about these issues are not our principles. Mm, so I ask myself, good. what am I doing with this opinion? It's easy to have an opinion, which can just be reactive. It can just be going along with the tribe that we want to be part of and, and align with our current sense of who we want to be to the world. So it's like in a clinical session. Let's say I have a father in a session with his um, parenting partner say to me, well, I just think she's too soft on the kids. So he's expressing an opinion. And so I will ask, um, what have you been doing with that opinion? Is it something you've been talking to your wife about? Has she heard that before? It stops me getting triangled with his opinion and it stops me thinking that the content of the opinion, what's the right kind of parenting for our kids, is where it's all at. It's not at that level. It's at the relationship level. How is this dad or how am I with my opinions living out my response to those opinions? And that's very humbling in relation to things like climate change and Am I consistently living out my small part in the decisions I make? And a lot of the time I'm not. I'm just being lazy. So there are a few thoughts, Bill. Those are wonderful, face, Jenny. Those face are wonderful. These big challenges. Yeah, uh, opinions are not principles. And, and, and if I can self, if I could work on myself of keeping myself man managed, particularly that my anxiety that I, that I just don't spread my 
my anxiety around would be so helpful. Just just doing those two things, opinions are not principles, and managing myself are huge. Yeah. Well, Jenny, to kind of wrap things up, I always ask my, my guests, and I, I truly appreciate our time. I, it's been, I've been tremendously blessed just to listen to you and, and, and so grateful that you'd be willing to, to see me. That it, it, it's, what, 10 o'clock or so, 11 o'clock in the morning? Uh, you're already it's in tomorrow. on 11 a.m., so <laughs> you're this is a work in, day for me. <laughs> you're in tomorrow it's already. <laughs> I've still got the effects of my morning coffee bill, so it's okay. It's good. It's good. Doing it's fine good. here. Well, I always ask my guests, uh, if, if, if 30 second elevator speech, we're in an elevator together and what might be a 30 second elevator speech you can give to our listeners thinking about guys, uh, it's guy shrink, but, but we have a lot of women that are listening as well. What might be a, a 30 second, uh, bite size piece of encouragement or guidance that you'd like to send off, send off to our listeners. What might that be Jenny? Uh, I, the, the phrase I find myself using a lot at the moment is how am I representing myself? So that would be my even shorter than 30 seconds. Just <laughs> how am I representing myself? It gets our eyes off the other and how am I representing myself in my relationships, which is things like how am I representing what I'm feeling, what I'm thinking, what I'm going through right now, what I'm challenged by right now, what I hope for right now, how I'm trying to deal with something in my life right now. If we could represent ourselves like that in our key relationships, we'd be really known and make space for others to represent themselves to us. Well, thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Jenny. Uh, our guest today has been Dr. Jenny Brown, who is the uh, the founder and lead uh, founder and lead therapist? Is that I the same? I am no longer the lead. Ah, <laughs> I'm very okay. pleased to say I have a really competent successor. I remain on faculty at the Family Systems Institute, okay, but wonderful. after 18 years, I, we have a new leader carrying very on good. the mantle. Very good. Yeah. Good. In Sydney, Australia. She, uh, so uh, she's. Uh, we're having a wonderful conversation uh, here on Guy Shrink, and I want to thank her again, and thank all of my listeners, our listeners. And if you could, uh, if you're listening, and this has been a helpful thing, uh, drop me a line at Bill at uh, GuyShrink.com or leave a review uh, on uh, a couple of our platforms. We'd, we'd appreciate that. And uh, check us out again. So thanks very much. Uh, Dr. Brown, thanks for coming. Thanks for having me.